welcome to the National Mentoring Summit's first plenary highlighting girls. So this conference is the culmination of a lot of work and we are so excited to have you here. I know that we are all in this room today because we care about empowering and uplifting young women. I know, I know a lot of you are mentors to young women yourselves. So we're here to highlight the ways in which mentoring helps girls excel within school, work, civic engagement, and sports. Uh, so my name is Aaliyah Cook. I'm 18 years old. I'm a student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> but I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> so I'm just here to share with you my story and the ways in which mentoring has helped me excel, specifically within the field of civic engagement. Uh, so my story actually starts in the third grade. I was about eight years old, and I actually started to become way more aware of my race and my own culture. I started to really take an interest with the African-American struggle. And it was because of this newfound interest in African-American culture that I kind of started to view the lens through my race as well and to kind of start to critically examine my classroom specifically. So I started to notice that I'd actually never had a teacher of color. Um, and this was something that started to bother me really and so I went to my mom and I asked her mom how come I've lived in the Cherry Creek School District for four years and have never had a black teacher and she just said well I don't know why don't you write a letter about it uh, and so that's what I did uh, I wrote a letter to my principal just essentially explaining my frustration and never having had a black teacher and asking him why I had never had a black teacher uh, and instead of just passing it off, he actually responded to my letter and he did me one better and he sent it to the superintendent of our school district. Uh, so when I was in the third grade, I had a meeting with the assistant superintendent of the Cherry Creek School District and they sent their diversity representative out to talk to me about recruitment and how challenging it is to bring teachers of color to Colorado and I got to talk to him about why it meant so much to me to have a teacher of color. Um, but actually, my school heard me loud and clear because right about the time that I started writing letters back and forth to my administration, my school was in the process of hiring an African-American female teacher. Uh, her name was Miss Hill. I would like to preface that by saying my school was already in the process of recruiting her when I started writing letters. So she was not hired just because she was black. She was a very capable individual who just happened to be hired around the time that I started writing letters to my school asking to have a black teacher. So that was really cool. So Miss Hill was my first and only black teacher, and I actually got to be in her classroom in fifth grade. Uh, and so word of my advocacy kind of got around. I'm not exactly sure how, but there are only like two black people in the entire state of Colorado, so <laughs> <laughs> news spreads very quickly. So, so I actually, uh, my word of my advocacy got around. I was featured in the Denver Post, which is our local publication. And I actually was invited to speak at an event called the Salute to Excellence, which is an event that honors teachers and administrators of color. So I was their youth keynote speaker for four consecutive years. And, and it's actually there that I met then representative, now Senator Rhonda Fields. Uh, Rhonda, Rhonda Fields told me that she was planning on introducing a bill um, in our state legislature to address the lack of diversity in Colorado education. And she asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. So I said yes. Um, so when I was in the seventh grade, I was about 11 years old, I went down to my state capitol building and I got to testify once in front of the House and then in front of the Senate, uh, just in, on behalf of House Bill 14-1175. And I just essentially explained to my representatives the fulfillment that I got from having a black teacher and how important it was to my development and to my education. And I asked them, to help other kids in my state be able to have the same experience that I did. Uh, and so House Bill 14-1175 was actually signed into law by Governor Hickenlooper on June 6th of 2014. Um, so it's a state law now, which is super cool. Um, and so I've received a lot of praise and accolades for my role in helping uh, House Bill 14-1175 get signed into law. Um, but I attribute a lot of my success within civic engagement really to the mentors that I've had throughout my life and the adults who took the time to listen to me 
and to invest their time and their resources into helping a young girl with a dream do what she wanted to do. And so although I'm, I'm proud of myself for what I've accomplished, even more than pride, I just feel extremely blessed to have been given so many adults in my life that genuinely care about me and that have genuinely spent time investing their money and their resources and just their encouragement to help me be the change that I wanted to see in my community. And so some of these adults include my principal, Mr. Richie Strickland, who didn't just overlook a letter that he got from an eight-year-old. He actually took the time to respond to it and he sent it on to my superintendent. Uh, the Cherry Creek School District for taking the time out of their busy day to send their diversity representative down to my school and have a conversation with me about what diversity really means and why it's actually pretty challenging to achieve. Um, Ms. Hill, who was the first black teacher I've ever had throughout public school, um, she continued to be a mentor to me even after I left the fifth grade and I've been over to her house multiple times and she continues to show me what a capable and talented and amazing black teacher is supposed to look like. Um, and also Annette Sills Brown, who is the head of the Salute to Excellence and who invited me to speak at her conference for four years in a row and who really be, gave me a platform to share my story with the world. Uh, there's also my mom who encouraged me. <laughs> there she is right there. <laughs> who encouraged me to investigate a simple question I had all those years ago. My mom has helped me prepare every single one of my speeches that I've ever done. Uh, she's helped me advocate for what I want because closed mouths do not get fed. And she's helped present me to the world. Um, and last but not least, my grandma, who recommended that House Bill 14-1175 be named Aaliyah's Law. And so it was. Uh, so now it's on Colorado record as a law. Well. Yeah. So this journey has really shaped me as a person, and even today I continue to advocate and speak for what I believe in. And the reason why I'm here with you today is because despite just being 18 years old, I have been gifted with adults in my life. And I've been gifted with people who have taken the time to listen to me and to invest in me. And I think I attribute my success specifically within civic engagement to this community of mentors that I've had and the mentoring relationships that I've been able to form with people. And it's because of mentors like you that I've actually been able to meet some really cool political and civic leaders, uh, which is super awesome. And so, one of the ways that I feel like my civic engagement has especially been enhanced is by the fact that I've always had mentors that look like me. Um, it's been super important, I think, to my development to have so many black female mentors in my life. And I think it's really what's pushed me to try to be my best and to try to do my best. And I, I genuinely believe that if girls were given the opportunity to have adults in their life that they can not only look up to, but also relate to, that they could be placed in situations where they could not only reflect on their own trauma, but also learn how to be the change that they want to see in their own communities. Um, some of my mentors have really helped me to see that I want to be just like them, and it's because of that that I strive to be just like them. And it's because of this mentoring that I have been able to accomplish some really cool things, uh, not just with Aaliyah's Law, but also in other areas of my life. So I'll tell you a quick story about that. Uh, so unfortunately, when I was a junior in high school, there was an incident at our school where a school official was having inappropriate relations with teenage girls. Yeah, that was a big yikes. It was tough. Um, <laughs> and, but I felt like the way my school addressed this was, uh, and I'm not sure if they meant to do this on purpose, but at the same time that news of this scandal was kind of breaking and everyone in the community was trying to process it, my school really started cracking down on the dress code. Um, it was inc incredibly punitive and extremely embarrassing. They would like to call girls out in front of their friends and take them down to the office and make them put on big ugly t-shirts from Goodwill when they weren't um, you know, fitting the dress code. And I didn't really feel, I felt like it was especially punitive towards girls, but I also felt that it just wasn't very conducive to a learning environment. 
And it also came at a time when a member of our faculty had taken advantage of a lot of young women, and I just didn't really feel like the way my school dealt with that was a very appropriate response. Um, and my younger sister, Milani, was also having problems at her middle school with what she felt was an excessively punitive dress code system. So one day we were just ranting to my mom about it, talking about how we hated it and how it didn't make any sense. Um, and my mom, instead of tossing us to the side, not really caring about it, or instead of fighting our battles for us, she just organized a meeting at our school. Uh, so my sister and I got to have a meeting with our principals and uh, a representative from our school district and just really sit down and have a conversation about why extremely harsh dress codes don't necessarily help a learning environment and why they aren't necessarily conducive to a proper learning environment. And it was because of this and a lot of other activism at my school that the dress code was actually changed. And so I think that's one of the ways that my mentors have helped me be more comfortable and more confident addressing the problems that I see in my community. Uh, so thank you so much for allowing me to speak here today. I'm so happy to be here and I'm so excited to see what everyone is going to do in their workshops and what they're going to do to help advance mentoring, especially mentoring in young girls. So I will leave you with a quote. Um, God bless strong women. May we be them. May we raise them. And most importantly, may we mentor them. So thank you and I hope you have a great time at the conference. <laughs> From the Youth Advisory Board of Media Girls, please welcome Megan Burns and Caroline Taylor. Hi, National Mentoring Summit. I'm Caroline Taylor, and this is Megan Burns, and we are members of the Youth Advisory Board of Media Girls, a nonprofit program in Boston focused on elevating girls' voices and breaking down gender stereotypes in media. We'll be asking the audience a few questions throughout this session. The first question is, how can mentoring help young women and girls build and protect their confidence? Yes. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Tori weeston Certain, Youth Mentoring Action Network. I got family in the building. So I would say first and foremost, the fact that we spend our time as mentors should already help build the confidence of young women and girls because we're telling them that they matter. And we tell, we're telling them that they're worth an investment. I think the second thing is that we need to create spaces for them to be themselves, spaces for them to be loved, supported, resourced, um, advocated for. I think that's particularly important. And then finally, providing platforms for them to do what we're seeing right now, right? For, to give them opportunities to practice utilizing their skills and continue to build their confidence. Thank you so much. Social media can be a hard place to exist for a girl. How can we support young women and girls when it comes to living life online? Right, thank you. That's a tough one. My name is Tessie Ojo, and I'm the chief executive of the Diana Award. The good thing is that we run an online program, so I can talk to that. I think social media is a, is a great tool. Technology as a whole is great for young people. It, con it allows us to connect with the world. And I think we must balance the opinion between being overly protective, but allowing young people to participate properly online. I think key is about two or three, three things. Firstly, how we need to help young people build the right level of resilience so that we're not believing, we're not being gullible, we're not just consuming all the, everything we see online, but we are able to just understand that not everything we see is true. We also need to build in some form of critical thinking skills so that we completely think, oh, actually, that's, you know, you see the fake and the real, and you're like, yeah, that's not true. That's just Instagram life, real life. They're not really like that. Um, there's also that thing of encouraging young people to this whole fear of missing out. You feel like I'm missing out of something big. Actually, no one's missing anything. Like, you live your life in your own lane. I think a lot of it is about really encouraging 
young people to just be their true self and live authentically and find have good have a good balance between your social media life and your real life because ultimately your real life is what matters thank you for sharing Amid mentors, Ashley Sofer. Hi, everyone. So first of all, I want to say it's an unbelievable challenge to have to follow Aaliyah. <laughs> So I'm not going to have anything nearly as impactful, and I can certainly say that when I was 18, or eight for that matter, I wasn't nearly as eloquent or as motivated. So I think what's so incredible about having youth speakers give remarks like that, though, is it reminds us all exactly of why we're in this room and why we're doing this work. So um, as my introduction said, I'm Ashley Zofer. I'm the director of Million Women Mentors. And Million Women Mentors is an initiative of a company called STEM Connector. STEM Connector looks at the STEM talent pipeline as a whole and works with Fortune 500 companies, post-secondary institutions, leading national nonprofits to help them think about how to invest further down the pipeline, how to look into overlooked talent pools, and how to really build a more diverse and sustainable STEM workforce. But back in 2014, a group of our leaders came together and wanted to look at one particular challenge that they were seeing, which was the lack of women pursuing and persisting in STEM careers and leadership opportunities. Women are 50% of the workforce, but only 24% of the STEM workforce. And on top of that, 50% of them drop out of STEM careers within their first 10 years. So of course, I don't need to explain to anyone in this room why we chose mentoring as a lever of change. We know that girls with a mentor are two and a half times likely to feel confident in their ability to succeed in academics and in careers. Women with mentors are able to see the pathways that'll get them into those careers. And you know, I'm sure you've heard it a million times today, but if you can't see it, you can't be it. And by creating those role models and mentors, we allow for people to actually see what they can become. So Million Women Mentors was founded in 2014 with the goal of reaching one million mentor relationships by 2020. As you all know, we're now in 2020, and I'm very excited to report that we have served 1.7 million mentor relationships. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is. 1.7 million is a lot, a lot of people, and that is 1.7 million women and girls who might have an opportunity they didn't have because of that mentor. But there are billions of women in the world, so our work is certainly not done. And as we think about where we go next, it's all about sharing best practices. It's about collaboration. It's about scaling our movement globally. Most of our work has taken place in the United States, but last year we were excited to work with the United States State Department to launch Pakistan efforts. So if somebody would have come up to me and said, where do you think the first country you're going to expand your mentoring program for women is, I wouldn't have guessed Pakistan. Um, but we've had a great group of companies come together and say that they want their employees to be out there as those role models and mentors in the community to get more women into the economy. Last week, I was incredibly honored to get to launch our Million Women Mentors India initiative at the World Economic Forum in Davos, alongside leaders from Johnson & Johnson, Tata Consultancy Services, PepsiCo, S&P Global, and Deloitte. And so it's, so it's an honor to be working with these companies who are seeing those challenges too, these corporations who can say, we have the employees to go out and be those role models and mentors. And I think the biggest thing to remember is that it's again about collaboration. There's never going to be one initiative or one company or one program that's going to make all the difference for women and girls. It's about coming together and learning from each other and having those shared experiences, which is why it's incredible that we're able to work with Mentor. We would have never hit that 1.7 million number if it hadn't been for our partnership with Mentor and the fact that their Mentor um, Connector allows us to partner with over 1,600 nonprofit organizations across the United States. So these are the kind of opportunities that are so important and why I'm excited to be able to moderate the conversation that's going to happen on this stage today. It's all about, you know, if you think about mentoring and especially the way I've done mentoring in my career, it's very much about academics, it's very much about careers. How can you get those career role models? How can you have people help you get into college and persist through college? But this is also about life mentors and how we can find role models in every stage and phase of our life, including in the arts, including in sports. And that is just important, is not more important, to see that there are those role models and mentors from every stage of your life. So to begin the conversation, I would like to welcome to the stage Jillian Green from We Coach, Carolina Dominguez from EY, Nancy Deutsch from the University of Virginia, and Kristen Corpus, who is a musician and a writer.
So thank you all so much again for joining us today and for sharing your work and your stories. Um, I would love to begin just by having each of you talk a little bit more about your role and then specifically how mentoring can be used as an opportunity to show women their best selves, particularly for your domain. Sure. Am I up? Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Jillian Lochran. I am a member of the We Coach team. We work to help organizations increase their social impact through sport. And so that looks a few different ways. We work with corporations, foundations, and professional sports teams to really make meaningful investments in the community. We work on the program level to design and implement trauma-informed positive programming for young people in the area of sport. And then we also work directly with coaches to make sure that they're trained and have the resources and knowledge that they need to be those positive mentors. I also am the executive director of Philly Girls in Motion, which is a nonprofit organization using the power of sport and fitness to empower girls in Philadelphia. Uh, when, when it comes to sport, most people don't think of that as a safe space for girls. Because most women and girls unfortunately suffer from perfectionism and sport is not a place where when you're entering for the first time, you're perfect. And so the role of a mentor in sport really can do all the wonders of what a buffer can do in creating that safe space and allowing girls to persist in sport. And so we'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit more about that, um, but it really comes to being intentional about the space you're creating and intentional about the relationship you're building with your team. Hi everybody, I'm Kristen Corpus. I'm a freelance musician, editor, and journalist. Um, I think that my path with mentorship has been, I think, a little untraditional just because my entire work is based in my community where I work from home. So all of my relationships with my editors, with coworkers are all essentially online, which is a really unique space to be in when you're asking someone for advice or asking someone for their help. Um, but I think what's been really important in building my community of mentors um, has been social media. And I'm so glad that that was touched on before we came on stage uh, because it allowed me to see when I was first starting off in my career path, um, how editors are changing the face of what media we all consume. So uh, a lot of the publications that I write for, thankfully, now have Asian women of color on their staff, um, Asians and other women of color on their staff who are choosing which journalists they work with, who are choosing what stories they choose to publish. And that is hugely important for you know, people who are growing up, who are reading these magazines that I write for and, um, and getting to see you know, their, their faces, their skin types, their hair colors, all represented in that media. Um, and then within the music industry, I think we still have a long way to go, I will say. Um, I think specifically for Asian women, it's been a little bit of slow progress in the music industry. Um, I've definitely gotten the comment, uh, you're really pretty for an Asian girl, wow. wow. <laughs> and so I think it's been, it's been a, one, of those, um, one of those things where the music industry is so still heavily reliant on how people look, on you know, your body type, and I think that seeing people, uh, specifically people of color, people of different body types, on stage on a national and international platform has been really huge um, in allowing more voices to come up. Hi, I'm Carolina Dominguez, and I lead EY's work in supporting the next generation, specifically with a focus on youth. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which we activate our purpose of building a better working world uh, is through mentoring. So in my role, I get to develop, design, and identify mentoring programs that our people can participate in. Uh, and EY for a long time has been a leader in uh, helping women advance and develop in the workplace. Um, we've been named uh, to the working mothers list for the last, I think, 23 years and counting. Uh, we're really proud of that. Um, and you know, one of the one of the things that I think really helps uh, develop a culture or a space where women can be their best selves is when we, as an organization, we recognize the power of diversity and how important it is to have different perspectives at the table. Um, but it also means that we have to be real, right? Mentoring is a long-term investment. It means you're gonna roll up your sleeves, you're gonna do this work, and you're gonna wait until what you put in pays off. Mm -hmm. um, and we're working today with girls across the globe, teaching them uh, technology skills. We're working with girls who code, leading a summer immersion programs so that they can learn how to code. And we're, we're hosting career panels over the summer, featuring our best female professionals uh, through generation. Um, and all of that uh, is so that 
uh, we help those girls see themselves uh, in, in the workplace so that they can then um, you know, use their voices. And I think that, that really good mentoring right, gives you the backbone or the support, the crutches you need to use your voice in the workplace. Because um, you know, not only does the future of the workforce depend on that diversity, uh, but we're better when there are different perspectives at the table and a really good mentor can help you share that perspective. 100%, absolutely. Nancy. Great. So hi everyone, I'm Nancy Deutsch. I am a professor at the University of Virginia's Curry School of Education. I also direct um, the Youth Next Center there, which is the UVA Center to promote effective youth development. Um, and sort of, I sit as pretty much a researcher who focuses on adolescent development. That's, that's what I do professionally. And I study mentoring a lot. Um, and I began my professional career actually as a researcher studying um, or working on a gender equity evaluation at boys and girls clubs. And so one of the things that came out of that work was really the importance of the staff youth relationships there. And that got me started thinking a lot about mentoring in all sorts of contexts. Um, I've also been, I also have identified as a feminist since I was a very young kid and gender equity and equity overall has always been a really sort of part of my core. Um, so I come to this from multiple perspectives. So when I think about this question, when I reflect on it, I think of it both in, in my professional life, I do mentor within um, academia, right? And so um, I mentor others and I have been mentored by others, um, but I also research it. And so I was thinking about this in terms of what I do as a researcher. Um, and one of the things that I do a lot of is, is helping organizations, helping programs. I work with a lot of out-of-school programs and actually thinking about how we can support women and girls in all of the settings. So that includes formal mentoring settings um, and it includes single sex settings. It also includes co-ed settings in school and out of school settings, right? And there are opportunities for creating spaces for mentoring um, in all of those settings. And I really try to work with organizations to think about how they can infuse best practices for that kind of relational development, um, regardless of the setting they're working in. Um, and that also means thinking about the ways in which, although when we think about formal mentoring, and I think it's really important the things that have been brought up about seeing ourselves in mentors, and I know we're going to talk about that more later, um, but we also have to think about the heterogeneity within gender, right? Um, and so also when I think about researchers who study mentoring, I really, and actually programs that work with girls, I think about making sure that we are not um, assuming right, homogeneous groups within gender, right? So gender intersectionality, black feminists especially, people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins have pushed us to think right, about the intersection of identities. And we need to think about that when we say things like mentoring for girls right, and recognizing um, that gender identity, right, is e being exploded into different ways. And so what do we mean when we say creating safe spaces for girls and is that space the same for all girls? So that, those are some of the things I, I think about. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So many, so many things to unpack here. Um, I want to go, so I, I like one of the points that you just made too about how mentoring, certainly there are formal mentoring relationships, but a lot of mentoring happens just in the relationships you build and in the role models you see. Kristen, I want to ask you a specific question. So much of how we grow as women and grow as people is to share our stories and to have spaces by which to do that. As a musician and as a writer, obviously you have a lot of experience in being able to share those stories. What role do you think the arts play and how can we use that as a mentoring opportunity for women and girls to share those stories? Definitely. Actually, I'll re reference something that we were just talking about backstage. We were all joking about what celebrities we all happen to look like. <laughs> and um, and I, I was making a joke that a lot of the time when people say, oh, you remind me of someone, and they name the first Asian celebrity that comes to mind, even if I look nothing like her, right? So I've gotten Brenda Song, Lucy Liu, um, Constance Wu, anyone. Everyone has said that I look like some Asian actress one way or another. And so I think the importance of having people who look like you, people who represent your identities, um, come up in media and art is huge because, you know, um, I think 
one of the people that I consider a mentor is now the beauty director at Women's Health Magazine. She was my editor when she was working for Elle, which I still write for. Um, and she's a Filipino woman. Her parents are also from the Philippines, same as mine. And the way that we've been able to talk to each other about our shared experiences and the stories that we like to tell um, online, both, you know, it, around our community and also, um, you know, to people that we don't know, has been largely therapeutic for both of us. And um, it's so easy for us to grow up. I think specifically for me, I'll speak for myself. Um, growing up, I would read Teen Vogue, Seventeen, and all these magazines that I felt like were aspirational. I want to look like these girls one day. But then there were never any Asian models in the spreads. There were never any Asian actresses or musicians who were you know, being featured as the cover stars. And I feel like that's slowly changing because there are so many women um, who are making their voices be heard within my industry. They really want to uplift those voices. And I'm seeing more and more editors of color, more and more musicians of color. Um, and across the board, I feel like it's been it's been, I've seen such a shift, even in the past three years that I've been doing what I do, um, you know, in how we're able to talk about our stories. And I, I feel like I get to write stories specifically about being a Filipino first generation kid. Um, and that's been, it's, it's been such a huge blessing and such an honor in my life to be able to do that. But that's only because I've had editors who are willing to take a chance on those stories because they see that there is a lack of representation in those areas and they want those voices to be heard. Absolutely. I think building on that too, um, you know, in terms of representation, it's sad to say that we're still in an era where you constantly hear that a woman is the first to do something, mm -hmm. the first African-American woman to do something, the first female coach in the MLB. You know, all of these things are still happening. So I'd love to hear a little bit from you, Jillian, and from you, Carolina, because we see this in the work in the sport place a lot. Where, what are we going to have to do to get to a place where that's no longer important, where we're no longer having to say that? <laughs> Sports behind. I think we all can nod our heads. Everyone has seen the articles about Coco Goff, about the US soccer team, about the WNBA's big deal. And, and sports really just starting to hit that tipping point where it's become important to hear those stories and voices and they're putting them at the forefront. And I think it's gonna take a lot more at the youth level, at the grassroots level, of getting girls to buy in and believe that. Um, often we see that gyms, the best gyms go to the boys. The best uniforms go to the boys. The girls get the extras. They get the crappy practice time. That all feeds that narrative that female sports are second. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. And so we need to be better and more thoughtful about how we design these programs so that folks are thinking about girls on the forefront as opposed to as, oh, that's nice that they're playing too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, how do you think that affects in the working world where you have, you know, this is the first time there's a woman on a board or this is the first time there's a woman in the C-suite in this company. What, how does that play out for you? So, so for me, it's a little bit funny and I think business is much further ahead than, than sports because to me, like, women have always been math and science geeks, right? We've, <laughs> that's always been around. As early as 1976, 50% of accounting graduates were women. Um, and so I think business in general and EY specifically, you know, we've, we're committed to honoring them, to seeing them, to mentoring them, and to hiring them. Um, and so we also recognize, like um, uh, was said earlier, that, that, that we need to start early. Um, and for us, um, we sponsor a program called Cyber Chase. I hope some of you have watched it. Uh, and it's all about keeping kids engaged in science and math um, at a critical age when they tend to lose interest, especially girls. Uh, and so we start there, but all of our programming features, um, whether it's uh, just in time or intensive, one off, um, whether it's in person or virtual, um, all of them feature the strong, intelligent, powerful women uh, that make up the, the, the firm so that young girls, especially, can see themselves reflected um, in the workplace. And I think that that representation matters because you may be the first person in your family to go to college and to graduate, but you're certainly not the first girl to dream of making partner and getting there. Um, and I think for for business, we're a little bit further along um, in that field. Absolutely, and I think I think that points to something that Nancy, you were talking about a little bit earlier with these cultures of inclusion and who is included. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about you know mirroring how important it is it for you to have mentors mm -hmm. that mirror your image. How, what is some of your work, and what are you seeing in some of the places like that where that's important, and how do you make sure to create some of those cultures of inclusion? Yeah, I think so. So first, I think. Um, 
listen, 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 right? I mean, I think this, you know, creating safe spaces and supportive spaces and empowering spaces um, is about authentically listening and being open to hearing people's experiences. Um, and even when we share identities with somebody, right, don't assume that you know what their experience is, right? Um, and really making sure that you're hearing what they're saying to you and then being an advocate and a support. So I actually heard Tori Western Sedan here somewhere because I heard her voice. I'm a huge fan of her critical mentoring, right? And the importance of not just um, sort of supporting young people, but of helping young people analyze and critique systems of power and in working with them to break down oppressive systems, right? And I think that's part of creating safe spaces, right? Um, and if we're, and, and part of doing that is being able to hear what's needed for that work and what the systems are of oppression that any individual is hearing um, and working in that space. So I think, I think that's super important. Absolutely. And building off of that, I mean, so one of the things that we think about is, you know, women have always been there and they've always been doing this work to your yeah. point. Women have always been good at math and science. Women have always been writing and sharing their stories. Women have always been athletic. None of this is actually new. It's actually a lesson that I learned personally in my work. We, we were referring companies to what we were calling hidden talent pools. And I had um, a representative on, on one of my stages um, say, well, we're not hidden. We're there. You're just overlooking us. And I think that's also often true of women. And I'm wondering, how do we create more of those cultures where women feel that they are seen? And what is men's role in particular in helping us build those safe spaces and those environments where women are actually seen? And that's a question for everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, with sport, obviously it's a male-dominated industry. Sport was built for men. Women have really just started to tackle some of these big issues within the domain. And I think that what we've seen in research is actually that the view of women for of ma like male's view of women shifts when they interact with them in the sports space. There's something about that space that helps them see women as equals, mm -hmm. uh, more respected, people they want to hang out with outside of the gym, and, and that's a heavy thing to think about. Why is that? And so how do we get those conversations happening between girls and boys about sport? 100% uh, of boys have had a male coach. How many boys have had a female coach? Mm -hmm. And then when you look at how many girls have had a female coach, very low percentages. We need to shift that. So, and males are a large part, they're the athletic directors. They are the people organizing a lot of these programs. And so it really is getting them to the table and helping them see some blind spots that might be there so that we can change that. Absolutely. Um, I would say at least within the editorial industry, I think it's um, in the minority where the large majority of our of, of my coworkers and colleagues are actually females. So I think that's been um, a huge asset to anyone who's been starting off in college wanting to be a journalist and working their way up. They see themselves represented in mm -hmm. newsrooms, at least um, from the standpoint of you know, seeing other women in the room, which has been, I think, huge in my personal development and growth. Um, but I would say on, in the music industry, it's, it's definitely still got a long way to go. And I think the issue starts from the top, right? Um, in, at record labels and at publishing companies, a lot of the time the executives are men. And in those cases, they oftentimes want to uplift the voices of male songwriters, male artists, male musicians. And in that case, it, it leaves women at a deficit um, in the music industry. So I feel like if there's an opportunity for these men at these, in these higher roles um, to bring on more women onto their teams um, and so that there are women in the room saying, hey, we're looking to sign a new artist. I found this girl on SoundCloud. I think that she'd be amazing. That would be, you know, I think that would be huge. And I think also looking at um, breaking the mold within women um, because I think that in the music industry there is a very specific type that people like to market um, on the larger scale for big record labels. And it seems like, you know, the tall, skinny, bombshell looking girl is what has sold in the past. And so if there's a way for, you know, men to say, we don't need that, if they can be like that, they can look like that if, you know, if they're also talented, but we should uplift these voices of talented people who look differently as well. Absolutely. So for me, when we think about creating spaces where women can be their best selves or um, how men can engage with those spaces, for me, that's literal and it's figurative, right? If I think about how I grew up, 
Um, I ate less than my brother. I talked in a lower voice. I crossed my legs. I folded my hands. I, you know, I was taught to shrink. And he was taught to like eat as much as he could, sprawl out on the couch and take two seats, like talk loud. So he was taught to grow. And it took me a long time to speak up, to stand straight, um, to share my opinions. And the, the catalyst was mentoring. And I had a white male mentor who was like 30 years older than me. Um, but he did like what I think every man should do. If you're mentoring a young girl, um, he moderated his speech to match mine. So he talked in the sort of the tone and the, the, the pace that I was talking. He asked me questions and waited until I answered fully. Mm. He, he asked me for my story. He let me share my story. And then he told me that my story mattered, yeah. right? Yeah. And then he went into his own network and he showcased me in front of people who could make a difference, who could be my mentors. And so he, you know, he did all of the things that a, that, that a good mentor does. Um, and for me, it, like, it changed my life. And so when I mentor um, young women and girls, that's the, I do the same thing because it works, because it matters, and because everyone deserves for their story to be told. But I think it's about creating that space around them and letting them fill that space with their story so that they can then sort of pay it forward. Absolutely. And where does this yeah. apply in academics? Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in academia, I, I have had wonderful female mentors and I have had wonderful male mentors, right? And I think it is, there's this sort of running joke among women in academia, I think in many actually workplaces also, right, about how I, I think all of us have a story of having been at a meeting where you say something and then a male says it, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And you're like, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and it, um, so I think this idea of, of if you're a man and you're seated at that table, call that out, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that you can, if you notice it's not being said, you can amplify it, but you can acknowledge that you weren't the first one to say it, right? Um, yeah. um, you know, and likewise, so I, th I think of this akin to the way, you know, um, white parents have a role in socializing white children to help dismantle white supremacy. Men have a role in helping both men and women dismantle sexism, right? That, that's just the way it is. Um, we can't do it alone. Um, and part of that is, yes, about providing, building safe spaces, amplifying, mentoring girls. It's also about mentoring boys mm -hmm. to be the next generation who will do that mm -hmm. um, and to raise young men who will help dismantle those systems of oppression. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's actually an important the distinction, too, because, you know, I'm... I lead an organization called Million Women Mentors, but we are always reminding people that it is not just about women supporting yes. women. It is very much about men being those mentors, men creating those spaces and creating those opportunities, men sponsoring women in their companies to help them reach their levels of leadership and know that they're welcome and that they do have a seat at the table. And actually, we also know in our work that Mentoring, we know, of course, benefits the mentees, but it's not just the mentees. Mm -hmm. The mentor gets a lot out of that relationship as well. They're building their own skills. They're learning from their mentee. They're also um, engaged in the community and learning things in a way that they weren't before. But in addition to just the mentors and mentees, the organizations that provide those mentoring um, programs and opportunities also see a lot of benefit. Mm -hmm. So in my work, I'm working directly with a lot of Fortune 500 companies to create those mentoring programs. And what we see is that their employees have a better you know, investment in the company, they feel engaged, they're able to be out there in the community as those leaders. And I'm wondering across, you know, just if this extends far beyond just the corporate space, what can organizations do to create those formal mentoring programs? Of course, we've talked a lot about how mentoring is informal and formal, but how can we be more intentional about creating some of those mentoring programs in sport and the arts and in other art, um, fields? Yeah, there are some brands within sport that are doing an exceptional job of creating opportunities for their employees to give back as mentors. Nike is doing an amazing job with their Nike Community Ambassador Program 
program. Their retail employees are encouraged to go out and actually volunteer to get kids moving, and they're paid for their time, and then their time is actually matched where they can donate to a charity of their choice. So it's a really great way for their employees to feel fulfilled. Um, and then there's also those big professional sports teams that are giving back to their communities in a variety of different ways. A lot of them have coach programs where they are training these coaches off the court, um, and they're giving them the opportunity to work with kids that wouldn't have the opportunity to work with high-level coaches. And so if there are folks that are interested, there are plenty of models out there to replicate in the sports space. One thing we're doing really well. Um, I would say that there is a lot of opportunity to be done in schools for my industry specifically. Um, I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston and um, what I really loved about my school was that they were intentional in the kinds of people that they brought back to the school, specifically graduates from Berkeley who would then come back and um, speak to the students, hold workshops, you know, have one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. And I thought that that was hugely beneficial to all of the students um, because we were able to see someone who had, you know, worked through that system that we were currently going through and then seeing their path to success and then being able to incorporate their tips and tricks into, you know, the things that we were doing to further our careers. Um, and so I think that that had a huge impact on how I developed as a person and as, as a musician. Um, and so within, and I, I guess that can also be applied to editorial people who are in journalism schools, bringing back alumni um, or bringing in people whom you admire, uh, who work in high profile editorial staffs. Um, are, it's huge to get to see someone who, you know, did all of the steps, took all of the, yeah, the proper steps to get to where they are, and then having them come back, speaking to people who are at such a developmental point in their lives um, you know, in college and, and sort of figuring out what they want to do um, and how they want to achieve their goals, it, it's definitely a, a huge thing. Absolutely. Are you seeing similar work at EY, at EY with the, um, just creating actual official programs for mentoring? Yeah, so we're seeing all of the benefits you alluded to, how, you know, you build workplace skills um, and you bring them back, you, you know, you're better with your clients. But I think, um, you know, what we what we also do is we encourage, I mean, we talk about it wherever we are, and we tell our, our you know, our, our other companies, our clients, how important mentoring actually is. And not all of our mentoring programs are designed to build future accountants, right? We, for, for College Map, students can pursue whatever they want to study with scholarship support um, and these are underserved students who are first in their families to pursue um, a college education and uh, we're about supporting their dreams regardless of where they go right because they'll likely end up at clients um, and whatever they do um, you know it's it's sort of um, supporting this economic growth for everyone Absolutely. That's one of the things we always say, too, when, it's, when we bring up that it's not about competition. A lot of the people we work with are competitors, but they say, you know, we're going to compete for the same talent anyway. Wouldn't it be great if we were competing for the same 10,000 people instead of the same 100 people? If you're working on investing and building that pipeline, it's not just always about who's going to come back to your company, but also, you know, how are you building out that entire STEM talent pipeline, or n not even just STEM, but making sure that women are part of that conversation. I think we have time for one more question, and I, I think what I, one thing I would like to hear a little bit more about is what are some of the biggest barriers to creating those opportunities that we're seeing and actually connecting people with the mentors and the role models that they need? In sport, women are underrepresented, and I think until we have a significant shift in the media and significant shift in what girls are seeing, um, and it speaks to what you said about showcasing different types of beauty, different types of strength. Um, there's definitely going to be that barrier to getting girls even in the gym. And then it comes to getting more, like we said, men at the table to have the conversation about if a girl does walk into your gym, how are you going to approach that? Uh, and, and how are you going to design that opportunity for her so that it's something she can persist through? And so there's some significant ones out there, but I think the conversations are happening and it's moving in the right direction. Absolutely. I think the biggest barrier is actually finding a mentor. I, mm -hmm. I think that you know once the relationship is established, it's so easy for you to bounce ideas off of each other, for you know to have that sounding board. But before that, the lead up to finding a mentor can be particularly tough. So I think just I think social media has done a really great job. One of the cool things about social media is having those opportunities to see people mm -hmm. in their element working on the things that they're working on. You can reach out to them in such a direct way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think just encouraging younger girls to have the bravery to just shoot off a message the way that they would to a friend and then build that connection. Um, and then I think from there, the possibilities are limitless. Absolutely. Um, I would say that the 
Mentoring is hard. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, not everybody is a natural at it. It takes work and it's, it's a long-term investment. You need to be committed um, to mentoring this young person through whatever they're gonna go through. And, um, the, but we also have to admit, there's only so much that great advice and networking and all of the other things that we employ, there's only so far that those things can go against real systemic societal mm -hmm. barriers. Um, whether it's you know poverty or racism on college campuses, there's only so much that we can do as mentors to help students and you know young people sort of navigate what those are. And so uh, it's a challenge that you know I'm up for it. I want to <laughs> you know I want to do it, um, but I also like have to admit that that's it's very difficult for young people to persist even with a mentor. Uh, mentoring certainly helps, but it's tough. You mean you're not going to solve all of the challenges? Just Unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> Come on. I thought that's what we're here for. So, you know, it's, I think that in what, so if I think about mentoring in both K-12 and in higher education, right, um, you know, I think one of the things that school systems, both K-12 and higher ed, as well as after school programs and out of school time programming can do is make space for that relational development, right? I think that um, schools and after school programs at all levels are places where kids are coming into contact with adults. Um, we think of the usual, like, oh, the program staff and the teachers. You know, there are also, you know, the secretary in the front office and the cafeteria workers, right? There are lots of adults there. Um, and we oftentimes don't, when we're thinking about formal programming, don't value space and time for just relational development. Um, and I think that we can support the formation of mentoring relationships when we actually recognize that having some space and time for informal relational development is important. And also recognizing that there are often undue burdens, as people mentioned, um, that because of lack of diversity in, within settings, um, that there are oftentimes particular adults who are kind of menti magnets, right? Who have more kids going to them, um, whether it's because they look like the kids or because they have particular skills. And so there's often, and so really making sure that organizations are providing support and space for those adults who may have, be more overburdened, who may want to do that mentoring, but also, you know, I think that organizations can do, do a lot by valuing the work of those mentors and making space and time for it. Absolutely. Carolina, you actually also talked on one piece that I think was really important too, that mentoring is hard. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a barrier to entry for mentoring. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of people out there who say, I really like the idea of mentoring, or I would consider being a mentor, but God, I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And unless you're in a very formal mentoring program that has a curriculum and has exact, here's what you do, and here's when you meet, and here's what you talk about, I think some of those relationships can be very difficult. Do you guys have ideas for what are some of the kind of resources that we could create to make some of those easier, or at least help them understand that what you're getting into to is a long-term investment and it might not be easy for a while. Yeah, I think sports layered. If you don't know how to play sports or know anything about sports, why would you go be a mentor in sports? So first and foremost, there's that piece of just the skills and the knowledge around that base. Um, those programs exist. So you can go out and learn how to coach basketball. You can learn the fundamentals. The other piece is offering opportunities for folks that are interested to actually learn all the things that we've been kind of alluding to in, in what you all are here doing and learning in that what is it to be a mentor and how do you do it? That's not something that comes naturally to folks and there are some great resources. Mentor has a ton of amazing resources. Plug, yeah, come back next year. Um, <laughs> but also there are plenty of other platforms that I'm sure you can get your hands on and we can give you lists on as well. I don't know if I have any other ideas on that. No. Oh, I, yeah, I think there are also, so uh, Mentor, the National Mentoring Resource Center has, um, has a lot of, of resources, a lot of best practices guide, another plug, so I'm on the research advisory board, <laughs> so we actually do reviews and sort of have things, uh, toolkits up. Um, so I think there's, there are a lot of places that folks can go to get training. And I do think we, you know, we know from the research that training and support is super important um, and that actually having mismatch between expectations of mentors and the reality um, can actually lead, lead to unsuccessful relationships. So being honest is better and providing the training and, up front, uh, training and support both upfront and ongoing um, 
is optimal and really Absolutely. important. Absolutely. And that wasn't, they didn't ask me to plug Mentor, but obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously Mentor has amazing training resources to help support a lot of those relationships too. But I think, so it's been just incredible hearing from all of you. And like we said, I think just rem as a reminder that there are so many different walks of life where you can have access to those role models for women and girls and create those cultures of inclusion. So thank you all so much for being here today. And thank you all for, for listening to this. And I'm sure anyone on this panel would love to, to hear from any of you about how you could get involved with all of this different work and be those role models and mentors for the women and girls. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome back Megan Burns and Caroline Taylor. Hello again, and I'm back to hear more from our audience with a few more questions. The third question is, how can men and others support the girls' mentoring movement? Hi. Um, uh, Damone Jones from CBS Sports High School. Um, be super, uh, super careful about what I say because it's informed wholly by my own experience. So I am a father of two girls. And even though I shouldn't have waited, um, I did wait to understand how the systems of sexism have benefited me and historically harmed women and have tried my best to let that inform my approach to my girls in terms of understanding the defaults of maleness, the things that historically they would have been left out on, um, and trying to set a better example for the men around me. I fully appreciate what was said. We do have a role to play. Um, and I'm trying to better understand what that role is. And when ultimately I get to that point where I just don't know how else to move forward, I go to other women in my ecosystem, obviously my wife, my mom, um, and, and, and try to have them inform me what I should do, how I should approach it. And usually that just means get out of the way and, and just find someone a little bit better equipped to handle it. Um, but still nonetheless playing a role and trying, trying to be an example for, uh, I think, the other men in my life to, to understand how we've benefited, how we've harmed, and to try to not do it anymore. Thank you so much. Please welcome to the stage Melissa Richmond, Chief Strategy Officer, Running Start. When I was asked to speak today, I had two immediate thoughts. The first was, if I was a really great mentor, I would offer this opportunity to someone more junior on my team. So I tried that, and no one took me up. <laughs> and then I was left to grapple with my second thought, which was, how am I qualified to speak about mentorship? I don't have one singular personal and professional mentor who's guided me through the last decade. I was feeling a lot of imposter syndrome. So I'm gonna come back and talk about how I overcame that imposter syndrome. But first, I wanna tell you about why I am qualified to be here. I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Running Start. Running Start's a nonpartisan nonprofit that trains young women to run for political office. Um, and we do this using a three-part training model. And that training model includes confidence, capabilities, and connections. We give young women the confidence they need to run and win. And we train them in the hands-on skills that they would need for a campaign. And then importantly, we give them the connections that they need. Now, we didn't call the third pillar mentoring, as you might imagine, because it didn't have the same ring but also because we have sort of a broader thought about what young women need in terms of connections. So we do give them formal mentorship, but we also provide them with opportunities to meet role models who are elected women and with a great peer network of support. So you may know that just one in four of our elected leaders in the US are women, and that's true even though when women run, they win at the exact same rates as men. And so our job at Running Start is to step in at the key time in high school and college when research shows that women lose their confidence in their own ability to run and win, and we give them that confidence by providing them with capabilities, but really importantly with connections. And Tim Ferriss has sort of called this um, group of mentors sort of a tribe of mentors. 
So I hope you'll indulge me as I introduce you to some of the folks who have served in my tribe of mentors to hopefully expand the idea of who can serve as an important connection for young women who might want to get involved in politics. So for me, that group has included family, friends, teachers, bosses, role models, and even a few anti-mentors. So uh, my family were my first mentors because they love me unconditionally, but also because they keep me humble. My nicknames among my family include things like Worm, Grease Monkey, Liss, May May. They think I'm the biggest thing in the world, but they also sort of keep me in place, which I love. Uh, my next most important mentors were my friends. And I have had the same group of buddies from elementary school to the end of high school, and I still get together with them regularly. And I think I'm a little off on my slides. Um, they're there in the middle. We self-named ourselves the Notorious Nine. Now, if you have to give yourself a moniker like that, you're probably not notorious. But uh, those same friends have made me feel like I could be the best notorious version of myself. I also have a photo up there of my friends who I've had since we were roommates in college. And on this trip where the photos taken, the first half of the trip was spent doing a work project that I was behind on. And rather than complaining, these friends spent the day reassuring me and telling me how proud they were of me and how great it was that I was doing the work I was doing even though our girls' trip was being spent turning in a 990 form to the IRS. Uh, this final group is sort of my girl gang that I work with at Running Start, and I'm sure you can tell from the photo, they are the most enthusiastic group who really build me up and serve as peer mentors as well. The next group I'd like to talk about are teachers as mentors, and I'll show you two teachers that I had in high school. One is Christy Franson, who taught an early morning religious seminary class that I attended when I was 17 and 18. I'm late for everything in my life, but with Christy, I was never late a single day. The class started at 5.55 a.m., and I never missed a day because Christy was such an incredible teacher. She's the opposite of me personality-wise, but she would greet me every day with a hug and make me feel like I was the favorite student in that class. And so her ability to teach something she loved while loving the students really drew me in. This other teacher, Jim Padilla, was my 10th grade English teacher. And he taught us Chaucer and Descartes and Plato and a bunch of things that you might think a 10th grader wouldn't care a lot about. But again, his passion for the work made me love Jim and made me love the material. He turned out to then be the favorite teacher of my younger sister and brother. And we got to go to Italy with Jim which was a highlight of my life. He claims it was a highlight of his life, but I think he was just being kind. Uh, the next group that I'd like to talk to you about as mentors are bosses. So this first person is Spencer Zwick, and he was my boss when I worked for Mitt Romney over the course of 10 years. And Spencer made a goal in 2012 that we'd raise a billion dollars. And we were in a ballroom kind of like this when he announced the goal, and a woman in the back stood up and raised her hand and said, excuse me, this is an impossible goal. We will never raise a billion dollars. It has not been done in politics. And he said calmly, I love the comment. Thank you for your feedback. And I think we will because you're such a good fundraiser and so is everyone else in this room. And we were able to raise a billion dollars on that campaign. We lost. So this is a photo from when Mitt Romney won his 2018 Senate seat and he had us take a loser's photo um, with his 2008 and 2012 campaign team, which is pictured here. So we lost the election, but we made the goal. And so Spencer taught me to set these audacious, crazily ambitious goals to the point that other people are going to stand up and say, no way, and we were going to try for it anyways. My next boss who's been a mentor is Susanna. She's my current boss. She is the most positive person in the world. I don't know if you can tell from my facial expression listening to whatever was going on here, but I wasn't really hiding how I felt as well as her. So whether someone's talking to us or we're chatting with someone, she maintains perfect positivity in every interaction. And I have got to take a little bit more coaching from her on how to keep that positive facial expression, whether um, chatting or chatting back. The next group that I'd love to talk about as 
mentors are role models. And my first political role model was Carrie Healy. She was Lieutenant Governor of the state of Massachusetts, and I was a 16-year-old intern who worked outside her office at her assistant's desk, just sitting on the side of the desk as my assigned work area. And the assistant is pictured down there in a picture. Carrie Healy made me feel like a peer when I was a teenager. And the pictures that are here are from the last time I saw her, where as an adult, she made me feel like a peer again. She told me she knew what work I was doing and that she was proud of me. My next political role model is Barbara Comstock. And she was a congresswoman when I shared a really difficult story in the Washington Post. And she was the first person to call me to tell me, I've read your article, I believe you, I support you. So I listened to her voicemail, I had just gotten off a plane, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. She was the first one to call. Then I looked in my email, she'd emailed me. I looked in my text messages, she text messaged me, and I never go on Facebook, but she had also had her staff send me a Facebook message. And so Congresswoman Comstock was an important role model to me because when I had a challenging situation, she was literally the first one to call me and she hit me up on every method possible and made me feel unbelievably supported. The last role model that I want to tell you about is Laura Cox Kaplan, and she was the co-chair of our board at Running Start. She is often the most powerful person in the room when she's in Washington, D.C., but she is the first one to humanize herself by talking about a difficulty she had that day or a real struggle between balancing work and home life, and I absolutely love her for that. So now I'd love to um, point out something that I think Aaliyah hit on so beautifully today. I didn't fully realize until I was putting together this presentation that these women are almost carbon copies of each other in terms of looks. And I think that this underscores how important it is for people to have role models who look like them because it's so much easier to imagine that you can literally become them. And so um, this group of women happens to look like what I might imagine I'll look like in five years or 10 years or 20 years. And so I think it underscores how important it is that we have diverse groups of people making decisions in leadership and especially in elected office so everyone has someone who they feel like they can look up to as a role model. The final group, which I won't show you any pictures of, although I was so tempted, I actually had them in the presentation and deleted them in case everyone went back and watched these are anti-mentors. I've had a couple folks who I thought would be a mentor and they turned out to put me in an uncomfortable position where they made me feel compromised and I had to step away from an opportunity, whether they took it away from me or I had to resign because of the way they treated me. And after the last of those situations, I called my dad. I was so frustrated. Dad, I thought so-and-so was going to mentor me. And, you know, it's just terrible. And he said, they are mentoring you in the best way possible. They are making you tough and gritty in a way that you could not have been if they didn't treat you this way. And so I did take from those situations and luckily was able to step back. Um, I am so grateful for the people who've served as mentors to me. And I have had a broad group of people who have helped change me and shape me. And for the young women who are in your lives, particularly those who may be interested in running for political office, I'll tell you that the research shows that it's deeply important that they have a group of supportive women around them. And that in fact, people who are non-traditional mentors, like peer mentors, can be just as important as a super senior mentor or someone who is way above them in terms of career or more advanced than them. So I am I am just blessed beyond measure with the wonderful mentors I've had in my life. I am sure that the people who know you in this room feel the same way. And I'd encourage you to keep reaching out to young women in your lives as mentors. Thank you. Please welcome back Megan Burns and Caroline Taylor. Hi, I'm back for one more question. What's one piece of advice you would give a young woman or girl out there who wants to be the next president of the United States? Hi, thanks for asking me that question. Uh, 
I'm director of Project Males and director of the Texas Ed Consortia for Male Students of Color. And um, I'm also a faculty member. We're housed at UT Austin. And uh, we work with young men to become leaders, academic leaders, community leaders, uh, leaders at home. And I probably would give advice uh, to women and young girls, the same advice I give to my young men, is to find a role model, find a role model that you respect, whose values you respect, and talk to them, right? Understand them. And that could run the range from uh, your grandmas, your tias, uh, your abuelitas, your aunts, uh, and to public figures, right? And so uh, in our community, where I'm from, Latinx community, uh, Mexicano, uh, Chicano, we call uh, those leaders uh, las chingonas. We call them las mera meras, right? And so... Um, uh, I can think of a number of them off the top of my, my head, right? You're probably familiar with a lot of them. Uh, probably not familiar with my grandma Viola or my, or my Aunt Julie, but certainly uh, Latinas like uh, Gloria Zadua, Emma Tanayuka, Sonia Sotomayor, uh, as well as uh, Tori Weiss and Certain, and, uh, and uh, Tony Morrison. And uh, the last thing I'll say about that is... is uh, Understand them, uh, all of them have written autobiographies, uh, uh, particularly those public uh, figures, and read uh, and, and learn from those experiences and those lessons. Now, uh, another one that comes to mind is Michelle Obama, and she just came out with a book called Becoming, right? And so my advice would be uh, read her book, study it, talk about it with her parents, uh, talk about it with her teachers, educators, and uh, really understand the challenges and her trajectory and model your behavior on that experience, right? And you can learn a lot from, from, from somebody like Michelle Obama. And with those armed with that information, armed with that, you can become anything, including a president of the United States. Thank you. Media Girls has been an amazing opportunity where I've learned to use my voice to share ideas with the world. I have become comfortable doing this through the support of mentors that inspire and encourage me every day. Thank you. Media Girls helps encourage girls to appreciate the other girls in their life uh, that help them be the best person they can be. Thank you for attending the Mentoring Girls Plenary. We hope you can join us at 5.30 for our networking reception and the Renaissance Ballroom. <laughs>